First we had WandaVision, now we've got Star Wars Visions. Ugh. Well originally I was going to do, I've just watched Star Wars Visions, hot and fresh out the kitchen, but R. Kelly ruined that intro so that's the best one I've got. Anyway, you're here now, and in this video, we're going to be breaking down every episode of Star Wars Visions, which has just released on Disney+. The new animated series set in a galaxy far, far away has a lot of callbacks to the original series, movies from across the decades, and several hidden easter eggs laced throughout it. I'm just going to jump straight into it, but the first episode is easily my favourite in the entire series. Titled The Duel, it pulls from several iconic samurai stories and films from over the years. When the Ahsoka episode of The Mandalorian dropped, many people compared it to Yojimbo by Kurosawa. The entry featured several almost identical shots in it, and the story was very similar too, except for all the space wizards and stuff. Now the duel definitely feels in the same vein as that, and it also pulls on a lot of iconography from Seven Samurai. In it we follow a character known as Ronin, which in Japanese means a samurai without a master. Throughout the roughly 13 minute episode, we learn the truth about him, and discover that he's in fact a Sith Lord that's adept in the dark side of the force. As we know from the Star Wars saga, the Sith always come in twos, with one being an apprentice whilst the other is a master. However, the fact that he doesn't have one and is straying from the typical path of a dark force wielder makes me believe that he killed his master and decided to go his own way in which he was somewhat of an anti-hero. Now we pick up with him overlooking a village, which is later attacked by bandit stormtroopers that are the last remnants of the war. He's joined by his droid RA7, who is donning a Japanese samurai hat, and I absolutely love this design. This setup of an adult and seemingly childlike figure is something that's known as a lone wolf and cub motif, and it was also mirrored in The Mandalorian. Upon arriving at the village, he checks in with a Sullustin, who you might recognise as being the same species as Nian Num. We can also catch a Bantha and several other droids and species including a Tusken Raider, so, so, sorry, Sand Person, a Trandoshan, which is the same species as Bosk, a Dog, which is the same species as Sebulba, and a droid that looks similar to the one in Jabba's dungeon. We meet a young child who has taken over the position of chief due to his father's illness, and he commands an attack on the bandits, which brings forth their leader, who's voiced by Lucy Liu. The theme from this moment is clearly paying homage to the Ghost in the Shell soundtrack, and even her rising up shares similar iconography to that first film. She carries a lightsaber umbrella, which is playing on the bladed umbrella weapons that were used at the time, not only as shields, but also as a form of attack. She unleashes hell, and I absolutely love how bar the energy items in this episode that everything is black and white. This makes the lightsabers and blasters really, really pop, and it gives the entry such a great style. RA7 is damaged by an explosion, and it's plugged into a gunk droid, which are basically walking batteries in the Star Wars universe. It's at this point that the Ronin rolls into town, and takes on the bandit leader head to head. Revealing his red lightsaber blade, he shows he's not a Jedi, and we get an awesome Bride of Frankenstein-esque moment, in which the leader reveals her hair. During this, the Tusken Raider, so sorry Sam person, does the infamous battle cry that was first spotted in A New Hope, and the pair duel it out across the landscape. In the background we can hear similar music to Duel of the Fates, and we learn that the chief has surrendered. However, now that RA7 is fully charged, it allows them to swoop in and take down the bandits, bringing the duel to a more level footing. After travelling into a waterfall, the Ronin places their lightsaber onto an ornamental statue to use it as bait, and this allows him to get the killing blow on the bandit leader. The weapons that he carries are based on the Daisho, which literally means little big, and this set of swords is often made up of a long blade and a smaller one, which we see on display with the Ronin. He hands over a kyber crystal to the chief, and states that it wards off evil before heading off on his own way, and then we jump into episode 2. Now this is called Tattoon Rhapsody, which I feel is one of the weaker episodes of the lot, purely because of its, its weird out of place music number. Now the title may be based on Bohemian Rhapsody, but the word Rhapsody also means poem. We open with destroyed battle droids and clone troopers laying on the floor, and this very much signals the end of the Clone Wars. We pick up with a character known as Jay, who is fleeing death in the midst of Order 66. During his escape, his lightsaber breaks, but he's saved by a geezer called Geezer the Hut, who enlists him in his ranks. It's hilarious how, how he has an emo haircut and a nose ring. And yeah, just Disney, what what, are you, what the hell are you doing? Anyway, we learn that Giza left the crime syndicate and network that the Huts control, so that he could be a musician that brings joy to the galaxy with his music. 
Together with his group they tour the universe playing their songs, and this attracts all types of species including an Ithorian and Rodian who clearly aren't easy to please. However, it does also attract the attention of Jabba the Hutt, who sends Boba Fett and his palace gods after the geezer. Now speaking of geezers, I'm a bloody big one here, and if you're enjoying this video I'd massively appreciate the thumbs up, and also don't forget to subscribe to the channel for videos like this each and every day. Now Giza refuses to go, and this leads to them trying to outrun Boba. The city they fly out of seems very similar to Tatooine, mixed with Bespin, and we learn that the bounty on Giza's head has meant that they have to flee every show they perform at. Chased by Slave One, Boba ends up capturing Giza, which is when Jay steps forward. He tries to spark up his lightsaber, but due to the damage it doesn't work, and thus we get the idea laid here that he must bring his power in through other means. Boba takes Giza back to Tatooine, and the imagery of him making Giza climb into Slave 1 is very similar to when Fett escorted Han away in Carbonite. Inspired by the sound of the first time they played together, Jay sets out with the band to rescue Giza from the clutches of Jabba. This takes them to Tatooine, and we see the twin sunsets, which are of course an iconic part of the skyline. From here we jump to an arena, which just so happens to be the same location as the pod race track from The Phantom Menace. Jabba even watches over everything from his own private balcony as he snacks on the creatures that he did in that film. Amongst Jabba's forces we can catch his Gamorrean guards as well as Bib Fortuna, aka his right hand man. Now we learn at this point that the band made a deal with Jabba so that Giza could play one last gig before the latter is executed. Interestingly, Fett and Bib end up standing alongside Jabba and at the end of The Mandalorian Season 2 we watched as the former killed the latter. Now the song they play has lyrics in it like the speed of light, parsecs and it just blasts out across Tatooine. We even see it being watched by the cantina band in Mos Eisley Cantina, and don't feel bad yeah, you, you guys are actually better, in my opinion. Now some Jawas watch it and the song even reaches Obi-Wan's house, who is probably dead at this point, so yeah, good for him that he doesn't have to hear it. I'm just playing guys, I'm just playing, yeah Disney don't block me. Now they play in front of two torture towers and these also appeared in the Genosis Colosseum attack in Attack of the Clones. The power of the music breaks through and wins the crowd to the point that Jabba even taps his tail and even though it was supposed to be only one song, they are granted an encore. Now episode 3 is called Twins and this idea of twins in doubles is laced throughout the entry. Firstly we open with two star destroyers joined together and then cut to the two corridors before meeting our two protagonists. These are Kare and Am, two dark force sensitive characters that end up going their separate ways. Twins have of course appeared throughout the Star Wars saga including Luke and Leia and Leia's children Jason and Jaina. I know that doesn't count anymore as it's not considered canon but they are very important to bear in mind as these twins do get some inspiration from them. Now both of them trained to be Jedi but Jaina ended up staying in the light whereas Jason turned to the dark side. This is somewhat reflected in the pair that we meet in the episode and again it's like poetry they rhyme. Now I kind of view them as almost what if versions of Luke and Leia and we learn that they've been manufactured by the Sith for a dark purpose. This involves creating planet destroying technology that is somewhat similar to the Death Star but it requires both to be able to harness it. Now they are aboard a ship called the Gemini and this is of course referencing the twins in both mythology and astrology. Gemini has also been used from time to time to describe two opposing sides that share some similarities which the twins in this episode both do. Inside the Gemini we see the stormtroopers laid out in an almost mirror fashion and there are several shots in the episode which are completely symmetrical. Now we learn that the dark armor they wear powers the hyper cannon, but Kare steals the power core and we cut to his empty chair which looks exactly like the Emperor's in Return of the Jedi. Upon trying to escape he's confronted by his sister, stormtroopers and ATSTs. Kare pulls off his helmet to reveal his Luke Luke and this point of the episode very much feels like the anime equivalent of Darth Vader vs his son. Kare even has an X-Wing and an astromech droid called R2O and Am of course just looks very similar to Vader in her armor. They are of course relatives too and on the hull of the Gemini they end up going head to head. This is probably the most over the top battle that I've ever seen in a Star Wars property but I did quite enjoy it and it ends with Kare combining all lightsaber colors to create a weapon powerful enough to cut through a Star Destroyer. Just not his sister. Now he also tries to warn her with a vision of the future which prophesizes the death that she would face upon powering up the Gemini. 
He wants the pair to flee, however she refuses to join him and thus Kore cuts the ship with the hyperdrive pushing him forward in a moment that is clearly riffing on the lightspeed one from The Last Jedi. Like I said, this episode is very, very over the top and because I wasn't sure on where I fell on it, I actually watched it three times. The first time I was a bit like, yeah, this is too much. Second, I was like, yeah, this is slightly better. And the third one, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm really, really enjoying this. Now, Corey says there is no try, only do. And this was, of course, what Yoda said to Luke during the Empire Strikes Back. His sister puts up a fight, but the force of the lightspeed lightsaber destroys the kyber crystal inside her armor, which means that Gemini can't ever be used. Corey then splits one of the destroyers in half, and this of course symbolizes the split between the two. We end with Kare on Tatooine and his crashed X-Wing, and he looks over the twin sunsets, further tying back to the title of the entry. Now from here, we jump to the village Bride, which follows a Jedi on the run from the Empire after the events of Order 66. We also learn that Separatists stripped the planet of its resources, and in the end, all they left behind were battle droids. These were reprogrammed by a warlord and his raider allies, and now they control the entire area. The Jedi, who is listed as F in the credits, is summoned to the village by an old ally, and she observes the mystical powers that a married couple possess, as well as the traditions of the villagers themselves. Kind of felt like a lot of this episode was sort of just an anime story with a Star Wars name slapped on it, and though I wasn't head over heels with it, I did enjoy the music that was used in the piece. We discover that the warlord wished to take the chief, but that his daughter, who is due to be married, volunteered to take his place. It's very Hunger Games-esque, and united by the capture of her sister Soku, the villagers rise up in order to stop the warlord and his army of battle droids. He arrives in a ship that looks like a cross between the Millennium Falcon and Dash Rendar's Outrider, which appeared in Shadows of the Empire. The warlord tries to execute Soku, but the blaster bolt is stopped midair by F, in a move that's very similar to Kylo doing the same thing in The Force Awakens. On the hill we see the elder of the village sitting with what I believe is an Amban sniper, and F sparks up a yellow lightsaber, which was of course the colour that Rey had too. However, this is more of a classic looking sword, and she uses it to kill the warlord before leaving in her ship, which is known as a clone Z95 Starfighter. The next episode in the series is titled The Ninth Jedi, and we open a long, long time ahead in the future, in a galaxy far, far away. The Jedi have been near extinction for centuries, and we watch the daughter of a saber smith named Zima, who has been mining for rare kyber crystals that float around the planet. He wishes to restart the Jedi Order and provide them with the weapons to do so, however, a number of Sith Lords disguised as Jedi are hunting for those that are force sensitive. After receiving a message from the Sabersmith that calls them to the aerial temple that floats above the planet, we then join the Sabersmith's daughter who ventures out to him. First hand, we see that he's created a lightsaber which has an adjustable blade, and this actually pulls from Star Wars Legends. According to Wikipedia, in order to do this, one needs a high output deity and power cell that can change the focus of the lens on the weapon and transform it so that the power output and length can be manipulated. However, her father has gone a step beyond this, and made it so that both the length and colour depend on the user's connection to the Force. His daughter Kara doesn't have a strong connection yet, and thus it appears unwieldy and also colourless. Now it's at this point we get our first inkling that something is off, as Jedi hunters arrive at the location, and thus Kara has to deliver the sabers to the temple herself. Now her speeder shares a lot of similarities to Darth Maul's, and she's chased by the hunters. They travel through a forest, and though it's covered in snow, there are some clear nods to the one from Return of the Jedi. Upon arriving at the temple, the truth is revealed, and bar a few innocent Jedi that also answered the call, the Sith reveal their true intentions. It leads to an awesome battle, and joined by Jedis named Ethan and Margrave Juro, Kara takes the Sith head on. Eventually, her lightsaber turns green, and they fight to protect the Margrave, which we learn is the main target that the Sith have been hunting. After tossing one into a giant kyber crystal, this cracks it and sparks it up, and this actually somewhat carries the symbolism of a lightsaber, which signals to us that the weapons have returned to the galaxy. They even manage to bring back one of the Sith into the light, and their saber turns purple in order to reflect this. It's actually possible to make purple by combining the colours blue and red, and it makes for a nice little nod to the conflict in him. Together they head out to find Korra's father, who has been taken by the hunters, and she's given the title the Ninth Jedi as they travel into the galaxy to restore order. At least she wasn't given the title the Last Jedi, no, 
Next we cut to T.O.B.1, which is of course playing on the name Obi-Wan Kenobi. In it we get somewhat of a Pinocchio story in which a droid dreams of becoming a real boy, uh, sorry Jedi. Now the episode is clearly riffing on Astro Boy and the character designs are very similar. We watch as he lives on his father's moisture farm on a planet that has dual suns, but we find out that it's not Tatooine. They wish to somewhat terraform it and make it habitable so that people can live there. Amongst the rooms in his settlement are several inscriptions, including A-Wings and TIE Fighters, the Jedi Temple, X-Wings, Luke, the Battle of Hoth with 8080s and 80SDs, Y-Wings, Star Destroyers, Obi-Wan vs General Grievous, and lastly a Wampa. Due to his dreams of being a Jedi, his father tells him of a kyber crystal and he heads out in order to try and locate this. He can't find the crystal, but he's told to find the force, and as we know from Star Wars, droids are unable to wield it. However, he does find a T-16 Skyhopper, which you may also know from being used heavily on Tatooine. After sending out a message calling all Jedi, the Empire discover him, and thus his father has to hide him away, similar to how Galen Erso did with his daughter in Rogue One. The Imperials arrive in a TIE Reaper, and you may recognise these as being ships in Star Wars squadrons. He also says the mantra that was made popular in Rogue One, aka I am one with the Force and the Force is with me. Now similar to Luke, T.O.B. one finds his home destroyed, but he rebuilds it and terraforms the planet in order to make it habitable. I love the time spans in this entry, and watching T.O.B. one slowly rebuilding everything makes it a really gripping entry. After bringing life to the planet, T.O.B. one manifests the Force and creates his lightsaber. I know it's not really in line with the rules of the universe, but these stories are obviously inspired by it. However, I know some fans will be put off by these little changes. Well, they're not really little, but you know. Now, I just went with it, and T.O.B. one really comes into his own when a Jedi hunter arrives. He is knighted by the spirit of his master, and clashes head to head with the hunter in an almost black and white battle that calls back to the first episode. This felt way more classic anime than the majority of the episodes, and joined by his trusted droid sidekick, he charges up before taking down the hunter in a final strike. Toby heads out into the galaxy, and yes he's called Toby now, and he continues his father's legacy and we jump to episode 7 which is titled The Elder. Taking place during the time before the fall of the Jedi, this is probably my second favourite out of the series. We join a pacifist Jedi and his Padawan who are travelling to the Outer Rim in search of a rogue Sith who's living on an outskirt planet. I love the character development in this, especially how the young Padawan just wants action, but upon getting it, we can see that he regrets this choice. It's not too laced with easter eggs, but it's always good to see a master and apprentice on these kinds of missions, as they just add so much to the Star Wars lore. We learn that the Sith is an elder that's extremely adept at combat, and it very much plays on the anime trope of badass grandpa, or cool old guy as it's sometimes called. I'm not even kidding, that's what it's called. Now this is when there's a badass older man who's almost as cunning as he would have been in his prime. In the end, it's not the Jedi that defeat him, but rather time, and he very much represents the old dying to make way for the young. We learn that he broke away from the Sith due to the constant betrayal that they carried out, and this clearly takes place before the rise of Palpatine, who somewhat brought them back from extinction due to the order he put in place. Upon defeating the Padawan, the Master comes forth, and the Elder manifests Sith Lightning, which we saw Palps dishing out in both Revenge of the Sith, Return of the Jedi, and Rise of Skywalker. The Master is able to block it due to his lightsaber, and with help from the Padawan, he disables the blade, and then shifts before reactivating it to deal a killing blow. I love how much this pulls from classic samurai films, and we watch as the Elder crumbles to black rock and also dust. This is an opposite to when the Jedi pass away, as some are absorbed by the Force, and they simply vanish upon death. Now episode 8 is not the last Jedi and we go to Lopen Ocho, which is another one from the series that I really enjoyed. There's a shot that feels like it's pulled right from the opening of Solo and we watch as two characters ride across a bridge in their land speeder. Much like Han and Kira, they end up going their separate ways and again it's sort of like poetry because it's very similar. Now due to the city structures there's also similarities to Elite a Battle Angel and the design of the civilization is something to behold. The episode opens with an incredible one shot that takes us through the locale and we watch as the Imperials have somewhat ravaged the natural resources that exist there in order to further their own gains. 
we see a Star Destroyer hovering above the city and this was mirrored in Rogue One, namely when we got to Jeddah and saw the imps mining for kyber crystals. It's not too long before we meet Lope, a peasant orphan who escaped the Empire. She gets caught attempting to steal food by Ocho and her father, the ruling family of the planet. However, rather than scolding her, they invite Lope into their family and seven years pass. Seeing what the Empire do to the civilizations that they touch, the father decides to create his own rebellion on the planet and he launches an attack on the Imperials. However, his daughter sees an opportunity by making an alliance with the Galactic Empire. Whereas she sees the Imperials providing growth and prosperity, he sees the imps as occupiers that are getting in the way of progress due to ravaging the planet for all its resources. In the end, the Empire very much win because they divide the people and it could be a comment on how governments often aim to create division among citizens so that they can gain full control. The true conflict from the entry comes from Lope, who must decide whether to side with her adopted father or her sister. She ends up tumbling over the bridge and upon falling we can catch a calamari as well as a group of Quarren. The calamari is wearing the blue sweater that we saw one donning in the Mandalorian season 2 and you can actually buy these on clothes websites which I think it's H&M. I'm not shouting them out though because they've not sponsored me. Now after learning of a treasured lightsaber brought to the planet by a Jedi, her father passes her the symbol of truth that it has become. When he's taken out, Lope takes matters into her own hands and travels out to take on Ocho and the Imperials. Here she finds Ocho in Imperial White and much like characters like Kylo, she's turned against her dad in order to hold up the establishment. Lope's droid tries to show Ocho a photo that they took on the first day they met, but Ocho refuses to look at it and the pair end up going head to head through the night and into the day. Lope ends up defeating Ocho and though she flees, we end up with Lope looking over the photo once more. The three figures reminded me very much of the three force ghosts at the end of Return of the Jedi and that ends the penultimate episode. The final one is called Akakariri? Akariri? Akari, Akari, uh, never mind. And it begins with a crashing B Wing landing on a mysterious planet. This is by far the most abstract of the episodes, with a strong focus on music, rhythm, and also the artwork. The lightsaber fights in it are almost like a dance, and though I felt it was one of the weaker ones, there are some good moments in it. Now we follow a Jedi who returns to a planet to help to destroy the sister of a king who has learned the ways of the Sith. It's heavily laced in Japanese storytelling and the idea of a fallen empire being restored by a lone traveller who has returned to help. This motif has been adopted into several western properties such as Mad Max and the like, but it's very much a staple of eastern tales. Along with the princess, the Jedi returns to the palace and here he's tempted by the dark side. We learn that it is his destiny to turn to it and tricked by the Shogun, he lashes out at Princess Misa and kills her. The Shogun says that together they can bring her back to life and the Jedi joins with her in order to resurrect Misa. It's very much a retelling of Anakin's story and how he teamed up with Palps in order to save Padme. Though it has a slightly more upbeat ending in that Misa is saved, it shows that when a Jedi loves it can lead to loss and thus the dark side. Also, did anyone else hear Misa and think of Jar Jar Binks or was it just Misa? Anyway, together the Jedi and Shogun set off into the stars and that ends the series. Now overall, there were some ups, some downs, but on the whole, yeah, I think it was a pretty nice project that had some great animation in it. There were a lot of standout episodes here, but also quite a few duds that didn't really go anywhere, but there will be an episode that I think everyone will really enjoy. For me, the Animatrix is still the height of what an anime tie-in should be, and though I did enjoy this on the whole, some stopped it from being a complete recommend across the board. That being said, what I liked, I really liked, and I hope that Lucasfilm make this an annual thing where they get lots of creators on board to tell their own unique stories. I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10 overall, and that's purely because some episodes brought it down, whilst others were really, really good. Everyone's going to have different opinions on this, but I hope you enjoyed the video, and make sure you leave your thoughts in the comments below. We are running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Zack Snyder's DC Trilogy on the 30th of September and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the series. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so message me on Twitter at heavy spoilers if that's you. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of the perfect scene in The Mandalorian in which Luke Skywalker returns. 
We talked about why this moment works so well, and it's definitely worth checking out if you want some more Star Wars content. If not, then thank you for sitting through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.